Hey everyone, Ryan here. Welcome back to our oral surgery series. In this video, we're going to talk all about biopsies. So the big high yield fact to know with biopsies is that they are indicated after two weeks. So if you have a red or a white lesion and you don't know what it is and there are no changes and or there's no response to treatment after about 10 to 14 days, a biopsy is generally the recommended next step. So this number is really important to know for the board exam. I learned in dental school, when in doubt, cut it out. In other words, if you don't know what a lesion is, it doesn't resolve over time, the best way to find out what it is is to biopsy it. So the four types of biopsies we're gonna talk about in this video are cytology, aspiration, incisional, and excisional. So let's talk about each of those one at a time. So the first is cytology or brush biopsy. And this is where you repeatedly scrape the lesion with a kit brush or even a tongue depressor. So this is uh, an example of a kit brush being rubbed against the surface of a lesion. So then the cells are smeared on a glass slide and immediately fixed. And this is great for monitoring large tissue areas for dysplastic changes, particularly if you're able to slough off some of that tissue rather easily. The problem or the downside with this technique is that there are many false positives. So the full name for this is oral exfoliative cytology. And depending on the technique you employ, it varies in depth from just a superficial specimen to a deeper swipe, including the basal cells. But either way you do it, this is j still just a surface level biopsy. So next we have fine needle aspiration. This involves the use of a needle and a syringe to suck up the contents of the lesion, usually an 18 gauge needle on a five or 10 milliliter syringe. So this is done for the presence of fluid, ascertaining the type of fluid, or exploration of an intraosseous lesion. And the fluid is expelled onto a slide and once again fixed. So this is often done for radiolucent lesions of bone, like odontogenic cysts, ameloblastomas, and fine needle aspiration biopsy is particularly good for distinguishing between benign and malignant lesions of bone. And those are all things that we covered in our oral pathology series. So if you're interested in learning more about that, go check out that video series. So our third biopsy technique is the incisional biopsy. And this is a technique used when a lesion is large, particularly greater than one centimeter in diameter, and you're suspicious that it might be a malignancy. It's also generally used in an anatomic area with high morbidity, like the floor of the mouth, for instance. So this technique samples a particular part of a lesion. So you cut in a wedge fashion, you typically sample from the edge of the lesion, and the margins should extend into normal tissue. So a narrow and deep wedge is much preferable to a broad and shallow wedge. As you can see in this diagram, the broad and shallow wedge doesn't capture normal tissue. So we want to make sure that the cut is deep enough so that we can compare normal and abnormal tissue. One more thing to note, you should avoid necrotic tissue when performing an incisional biopsy. And finally, we have the excisional biopsy. These, on the other hand, are used for smaller lesions, generally less than one centimeter in diameter. And we suspect that they are benign. We can also use the excisional biopsy on small, vascular, and pigmented lesions. 
It entails the removal of the entire lesion and also a perimeter of surrounding uninvolved tissue, which we call the margin. So the margin is ideally about two to three millimeters of uninvolved normal tissue. And an elliptical incision is best because they are easier to close after the biopsy has been completed. So there are a couple biopsy techniques to consider. The very first thing you should do is to make a differential diagnosis, which is a list of possible things you think the lesion could be, with number one being the most likely. So this informs potentially what kind of biopsy you do based on the parameters we just went over. So local anesthesia is obviously important, particularly for incisional and excisional biopsies. But first, you want to mark your lesion with, say, an indelible ink marker like this before you inject any local anesthetic. Now, whenever possible, block anesthesia is preferred because a local infiltration can distort the architecture of the lesion and therefore distort and potentially complicate your biopsy. So direct handling of the biopsy specimen will crush cells, so you have to handle the specimen rather gently, either with a non-toothed adsin tissue forceps, like we talked about in our instrumentation video, and you would handle the tissue at the margin of the specimen, or you can actually use a silk suture through the lesion. And you store the sample in 10% formalin, with a biohazard label. And this 10% formalin is really important to know for the board exam. It does come up on questions. All right, so let's go over some clinical examples. These are modeled after uh, board exam questions, particularly on day two with cases. So let's say you have a large white patch on the buccal mucosa that wipes off with gauze and is presumed to be candidiasis. So which of the four biopsy methods would you employ here? Well, if we look at the clues, we have a large lesion. We're suspecting that it's benign. Most importantly, our differential diagnosis says that it's pseudomembranous candidiasis. That's what we presume it to be. And so it's something that can be scraped off and the easiest thing to do for a large patch like this would be a brush biopsy or cytology. And so that would be the ideal choice for biopsy in this scenario. How about number two? You have a firm, rough two by three centimeter white lesion on the lateral tongue that does not wipe off with gauze. So again, if we look at the clues here, just focus on the high yield facts that we talked about. This is a greater than one centimeter lesion. And we don't have a whole lot of information to go off of here with differential diagnosis. You know, it could be a papilloma, but those are usually smaller. It could, it could also be something like squamous cell carcinoma. But really, again, we just have to hone in on the key facts here. Nothing's wiping off, like in the first example. It's a firm lesion greater than one centimeter. So what we're gonna do here is incisional biopsy. And the last one, we have a denture wearer that presents with a red swelling in the buccal vestibule. And what would we do here? Well, this one's kind of a trick question because unlike the previous two examples, here we have a possible etiology. We have a denture that could likely be causing epilis fissuratum or some other irritation in the buccal vestibule. So this is a case where we would first remove the possible etiology and then see if anything changes or gets better in that two week period. So we would relieve the denture where it's potentially irritating that buccal vestibule and then see the patient back in two weeks. If it doesn't get better, the lesion doesn't change, then we biopsy. All right, so this is a little bit off topic, but sort of in the same realm. 
let's just talk briefly about some surgical management techniques for cysts and tumors. So for cysts, we often opt for enucleation, marsupialization, or curatage. For tumors, enucle enucleation, curatage are also used, and the more aggressive resection can also be used for a more aggressive tumor like ameloblastoma. So let's go over each of these four techniques just briefly to end the video. So enucleation is the surgical removal of a mass without cutting into or rupturing it. So here we have what I'd presume to be a ridiculous cyst. It looks like in the second slide here the tooth was removed and the lesion or the mass was removed without breaking it, without cutting it, without rupturing it, it was removed whole. And then it could be biopsied from there if that was the treatment plan. Marsupialization is a bit different. It, you, this one involves cutting a slit into an abscess or cyst and then suture the edges of the slit to keep it open so that it can drain freely. So this is a pretty interesting technique. It can be used for incision and drainage procedures where you want to keep the lesion open to the oral cavity to relieve pressure and allow the lesion to drain. As an alternative, you could insert a physical drain and then suture it close, or you can do this where you suture the edges of the lesion open so that it can't close in on itself and you're, you are physically and purposely avoiding and preventing primary closure. So this is allowing the lesion to drain. Curatage is a familiar term. This is the removal of tissue by scraping or scooping. We talked about the curette in terms of instrumentation and what we should be doing after tooth extraction, both simple and surgical, to scrape the socket and make sure that we remove all granulation tissue and infectious tissue at the base of the socket. So it's a similar idea. We're removing tissue by scraping and scooping. And lastly, we have resection. This is the surgical removal of a cyst or tumor and normal tissue around it. So if you're concerned about the reappearance of a certain lesion and you want to have wide margins, say for an aggressive ameloblastoma, resection of the mandible or maxilla can be used in that scenario. All right, so that's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching, everyone. If you're interested in supporting the channel, please check out my Patreon page. A huge thank you to Michael Raja, Ainz Lau, and all of my patrons for all their support. You can unlock extras like access to my video slides to take notes on and practice questions, so go check that out. The link will be in the description. Thanks again for watching. I'll see you all in the next video.